Have a seat. Have a seat. Man, I'm glad to be in the house of God. Man, I'm going to tell you right now. Is this on even? Okay, just checking, Brother Dan. I'm going to tell you right now, my heart's full. And that's all there is to it. And uh, I, I know other people get their thrills and kicks other places, but I just got to be honest with you, preachers, the only place we get our kicks is in church. That's all, you know. We, we throw the hat in the ring. But I can just, 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 let's just get it done. And uh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for letting me come. And uh, it has been uh, a, a lot of years. And uh, I just enjoy every single time uh, that I get to be here. And uh, thank you for Anchor for putting up with me all these years. And uh, watching me kind of cut my teeth. Uh, here at Anchor and make a lot of mistakes in the pulpit and uh, a lot of mistakes out of the pulpit and uh, and but I'm enjoying myself so I just got to figure this way if it makes sense to me by the time I'm done we had a good service and uh, so I'm waiting for myself to get right but I just am not letting myself get right but as long as me is in the middle we're okay and uh, so anyways that made no sense because I'm schizo Judges chapter 2 Judges chapter 2 Fernando is it brother Fernando Brother, you keep pulling in this parking lot with more vehicles than, than a car dealer. Okay, and, uh, but uh, is it the Spanish blood in you? Yeah. Are those cars even yours? Okay, I'm just checking. They are now? That VIN number's off. It is now. And uh, I was preaching to a Spanish group, and I was telling them uh, that uh, my daughter is 28 years of age. Well, she was born in November. Uh, so that summer, I spent working all summer on a roof, uh, and I was dark. I mean, I have dark skin anyways, but I spent all summer working on a roof, no hat. And I mean, I had the darkest tan ever. Uh, well, she was, uh, Kelly was in labor for a little bit, and because of that, uh, I kind of grew a beard, and, and I, have, I have to shave two and three times a day uh, anyways, and so it was like two or three times, and it grew, you know. When Deanna was born, and when they marked Deanna, uh, you know, the, the nurse is standing there filling it out, and so they looked at mom, a Caucasian. They looked at me and said, Hispanic. Oh. <laughs> On Deanna's birth certificate, it says Hispanic. Father, Hispanic. And uh, so I told Kelly, I said, you know, we're going to go get it changed one of these days. Well, days went by and days went by. And I mean, I look like you with a beard. And days went by and days went by and days went by. Well, we just kind of forgot to get it changed. Well, Deanna was about seven or eight and she found her birth certificate and she was looking at it. And she, she came in and asked her mother, who's my father? <laughs> and, and mom said, your dad's your father. And she said, not according to this, my father's Hispanic. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so it was like, oh man, we got to get it changed. Well, we meant to get it changed and we meant to get it changed and we meant to get it changed. And she got married and Josh found the birth certificate and said, <laughs> Who's your father? And uh, so I'm telling the story at a Spanish youth conference trying to identify. And so they told me, he, they, they said, look, you can't be Hispanic without having a Hispanic name. So they gave me my very own Hispanic name. I am Federico Martinez Lopez, and that is my Spanish name. So I have a fake ID coming. That is, I am Federico Martinez Lopez. Uh, and so... Uh, in fact, I had to, uh, you know, your passport, they ask you, are there any other aliases that you're known by? I put on my passport application for the U.S. government, Federico Martinez Lopez. Oh, yeah. And uh, watch, he's a mass murderer. Somebody Google it right now. Let me know. So, uh, but anyways, Judges chapter number two is where we're going to be at tonight. And I'm just going to preach and forget. I'm just going to preach, if you don't mind, and we're just going to get it on. My heart's full right now. I mean, that's a, dang, that's a dangerous thing for a preacher to have. You better me come here dry, we'll get done early, than to come here full because it, we just may stay here for a long time. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about staying a long time. So Judges chapter 2 <laughs> in verse number 6. Let's all stand if you, if you don't mind. Why do preachers say that? We don't care what you think. Stand up. So. But anyways, 
Uh, Brother Jenkins, it's always a pleasure to be with you, my friend, and I want to publicly say thank you for the kindred spirit that we share, and uh, thank you that uh, you, you've always been a gentleman in my world, and I appreciate that. And uh, plus, RG's driving him crazy, and that's a good thing. Uh, so anyways, uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 6, when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heras, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaish. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. Look at this. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. To me, out of every verse that talks about Joshua, the journey, the children of Israel, this to me is the saddest phrase ever. There arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask as you, as we gather around your word, and we came tonight because of you. The singing has done nothing more than confirm in our spirits about this man named Jesus Christ. Lord, I love how my wife put it no other religion can write as many songs about their god as we can write about our god because he ever liveth and because he's alive in our heart he's always inspiring us on different levels and god i pray tonight that you would just bless tonight we've already been blessed i pray that as brother jenkins preached this morning that it just gets gooder and gooder as we go along God, may what we're going to experience be much higher than what we have so far. And we've been on the mountain. Lord, just take us to the heavenlies tonight. Deal with us in such a way that you give us a vision for our future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's an amazing verse to me. How could somebody that carries the name of God how could there be a generation that carries the name of God that didn't know about God nor had no reference point for God's works? I could understand Hitler's second and third generation having no reference point for God. I could understand Mussolini's generations having no reference point for God, but not a group that carries the DNA of God, the very children of God. I mean, I mean, the children that God brought out of Egypt, the children that God protected them as they swung south and came up north and that they whooped everybody on their way to the promised land. How does there a generation that bears their name not know God? In fact, it's very interesting to me that if you know anything about the Bible, that Jericho, when the spies went into Jericho, Rahab the harlot said this, hey, I've heard about your God. Now, now how does a harlot hear about God and a harlot hear about all the mighty works of God? And this is back before social networking. You, you know how it got that way? Same way roaches ended up in your apartment when they started, when they started spraying five apartments down. Because when God started whooping them on this side, there, 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 there were people fleeing from these cities and they just kept going and kept going. And I promise you some roaches crawled into Jericho and said, hey, hey, there's a group of people marching up from the, from the south and they're like whooping everybody and their God's like taking out Og, you know, big Og. They took them out and they took out all the... They're whooping everybody and they're headed our way. And when the spy showed up and said, we are the children of God, Rahab said, oh no, I've heard about you people. How does a 
harlot inside of a walled city hear more about God than the generations that outlived Joshua? Dr. Hiles passed away and they erected a monument to him down in Italy, Texas. My father comes into the office and he says, hey, we're going to take a trip down to Italy. You can even pull up the video on YouTube. And he said, I want to shoot a video because I'm writing a book about Dr. Hiles and, and, and you got to run the video camera. So we got in the car, my mom, my dad, and myself, and we headed down to Italy, Texas, made a day of it. And we got down there, Brother Jenkins, and we were shot the video. We went to a gas station, and uh, there were people there that knew Brother Hiles, and, and they were able to, they were old, and, and, and they, anyways. So there's a young man there. My dad started witnessing to this young man and uh, started asking him about God. Do you go to church? And he goes, no. He goes, well, well do, you, do you know anything about God? He said, somewhat. And uh, we were shocked that in Italy, Texas, that, there, that, that, that we found a young man that didn't go to church, that knew very little about God. My dad asked him, have you ever read the Bible? He said, my grandmother had one, but, but we really, it was just a book on the shelf and really nothing. He, my father took the Bible and led this man to the Lord. When he went to write his name down, he said, what's your name? He said, my name is John, last name Dillinger. He was the great relative of the notorious, infamous Dillinger. Y'all, listen to what I'm about to tell you. We weren't shocked that he didn't know about God because he came from a family that didn't know about God. But you know what my fear is? Is that somebody bearing the name of Gray won't know about my God. Y'all, it's one thing for somebody who's never been raised this way to not know about God. My great-grandfather was a logger. My grandfather was a logger. Uh, simply what that means in, in Arkansas terms are that they would go lease land for the, for the trees that were on there and they would fell the trees, fall the trees and it's not like they, you see it today they actually would, my great grandfather uh, owned a business that they would take the saw, two man saw and they would literally fell the trees they would take the donkeys and they would just like you would can picture in your mind my great grandfather so my great grandfather my grandfather, my father now me and now my son Jordan gets married in October. So I'm talking about five generations. My great-grandfather, one morning, according to the testimony of my grandfather, he said, your great-grandfather sat down and one morning took the butcher paper and they would wrap their meat up and he took the butcher paper that your great-grandmother uh, was cooking breakfast in the morning. He took the butcher paper and he took and turned it over and on the back he started to write. Your great-grandmother said, what are you writing? And he said, I'm writing out my instructions here because God's going to kill me today. And my great-grandmother said, what are you talking about? He said, God is going to kill me today. He said, why is he going to kill you today? And he said, because when I was 13 years of age at a camp meeting, I surrendered to do God's will. And I've been running from God all these years, and God now has told me, I am going to kill you today. The workers give testimony to my grandfather in later years as he grew up. He said, your, your father, my great-grandfather, number one right up here, he said he was standing there, and as you can picture in your mind, you're in a forest, and whenever they get, get ready to make that last cut, they, they would holler timber, and, and, and that way everybody knew, step out of the way, look to see where they were cutting. By testimony of the men who worked for my, my great-grandfather, they said when they hollered timbers, almost as if your great-grandfather, God reached up and just muffled his ears, and he never heard the tree. The tree fell that day and crushed my great-grandfather there in the field. Because of that, my grandfather as a little boy grew up without God in their life. Because he grew up without God, he started to get into drinking and a riotous lifestyle and everything that comes with that kind of lifestyle. My grandfather was a very mean man when he was little. 
and he was a very mean boy when he was little, grew up to be a mean teenager and grew up to be a very ungodly man. And I cannot even go into the things that my grandfather was into. When my grandfather got married to my grandmother, Mary, then my grandfather, Green Perry Gray, and my mother, my grandmother, Mary Elizabeth Scott, married a gray, became a gray. They had six children. There were the three older children and then the three younger children. The three older children were raised by my grandfather, which was their father, in a drunkard's home. My older uncles and my older aunt on the, this side of the family, if you will, they would have to go get my grandfather out of the bar, clean him up, put him in bed, uh, and, and, and he was just a very wicked man. My younger aunts and uncle, uncles, which included my father. There was Jerry, Sanford Jerry, and then Glenn. That's my father's given name, Glenn, G-L-Y-N-N. And uh, they were raised by a dad who got saved and got right with God and decided to put God back in their generation. However, there was no God in the older set of kids' generation. You trickle that thing all the way down. I have been a very blessed man, Brother Jenkins, because my father made sure God was in my life at a very young age. And my grandfather made sure God was in my father's generation at a very teenage age. And I have made sure that God is in my children's generation. And guess what? Now I have a responsibility to make sure that God is in my grandchildren's generation. And I'm going to ask every one of you to step out on the highway of life. And would you look two generations down the road and would you decide right now that you're going to keep God in your generation and in your kids' generation and in your grandchildren's generation? God has only given you a responsibility responsibility for two generations. He is not asking you to be responsible for the third generation. He is only saying be responsible for the two generations that are coming after you. Inside your loins, single people, are children yet to be born. You have no right to decide for your children the kind of God they will or will not serve. You only have the right to give them information. Amen. Not ignorance. You don't have a right to decide for the children yet to be born. You don't, Brother Jordan, have the right to decide for your grandchildren yet to be born. And would you do all of us a favor if you're going to live a selfish life? Don't get married and don't have children. Would you stay single and would you crawl into a crack and would you die in the corner, but don't bring children into a godless home, into a godless environment? The day I decided to get married and the day I decided to have children, my life became not my own. My life became not my own. And now I am responsible to take the God that was given me and to step out on life and say, I will make sure that God is in my children's life and in my grandchildren's life. I, I didn't know what love was until I saw her. Whew, when I saw her, I was in love. I won't go into the entire story. I've known Kelly since the second grade. But, you know, knowing somebody and then God raising the veil to where you see her. You know what's better than that? She saw me. <laughs> now, 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 I didn't know what love was. Listen very closely. I didn't know how deeply I could love until I had a child. Oh, my friend, the love just expanded like that. You say, what was your first prayer? My first prayer when I held the end in my arms 28 years ago, I thought, oh, God, don't give me another girl. <laughs> because there's no way that I'll be able to love two girls. I can only love one. And I would hold her. I would come home from UPS and I would lay on the, on, the, on the couch and I would say, bring her to me, bring her to me. And she would snuggle right there in my chest. And, and I have pictures of me falling asleep with her on my chest. Boy, I miss her right now. I have pictures of her falling asleep on my chest. I didn't know you could love that deeply. 
I had no idea, Brother Weaver. I feel sorry for your girls because you got to divide your love. <laughs> I was not that multitasking. You listen to me. I didn't know I could love until I met Kelly. I didn't know how deeply, sir, I could love until I had children. But I didn't know how fanatical I would be about my love until I had grandchildren. <laughs> right, Brother Manning? They turn you into this weird person. I'm sitting the other night talking to this man, and we're getting ready for our teen convention, and, and it's going to be a long week anyways. And a, and a man happened to say to me, Hey, Pastor, can I see you for a couple of seconds? And I cut out counseling after Sunday night, go spend time with the family. And, and, uh, but this, I just made that exception. And so I said, sure. So we sit down in the office, and all of a sudden, y'all, I heard these voices coming through the wall. Three grandchildren, Blake, four years old, Grayson is three, two, three years old, and Natalie, Nat Nat. She looks like the girl from Hoosville with that big old thing on top of her head. Mm, you say, where's Hoosville? It's on this side of Jordan. And, uh, and, and y'all, I could hear the voices. Blake, they got it down. I'm Grand Bob. And so it's Grand Bob. I could hear this voice, Grand Bob, Grand Bob, Grand Bob. Grayson's like, Grandma, eh, eh. Nat, Nat, the only thing she can say is Bop, Bop. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm with you right there. So I'm trying to really get into this man's problem. I'm into it. And then all of a sudden I hear this, Grand Bob, Bop, Bop, yeah. And I'm like, uh -huh. those are my grandchildren. <laughs> all of a sudden I look at this man and he can tell I have completely zoned out. <laughs> because you know what I'm thinking? I don't care about your problem. <laughs> Committing suicide would be the best thing you could do. <laughs> and you know what you keep, how you keep from hurting yourself? Drink before you do it. Y'all, I am so checked out of this guy that, that, that I'm hearing Grandpa, Bob, Grandpa, Bob, Bob, Bob and, and, and I'm like, uh, I don't care anymore. And finally, the voices disappear. Oh, 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 I now know what everybody's going to feel like when they get left behind when the trumpet sounds. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like, no, no, no. No, 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 no. I want to go. I want to go. No. So I literally looked at the man and said, we're done. I got to go. And it's not to the bathroom. If you've ever been in my office, I got a glass door that disappears into the back parking lot. So I, I got my keys. I put in there. I step out on the back parking lot. The gym's over here. Building's right here. No grandkids. I just heard them. So I take a right, go around the back of the building. I come between the railroad ties and the, and the church building on this side. And, and there they were at the end of the parking lot. The sun has set behind them. I can see the shadow. The music begins to play. I, I, I go, Blake, Grayson, Nat, Nat. They slowly turn. They go, Grandpa. <laughs> I go, Grandchildren. I'm running toward them. They're running toward me. I learned from the soccer players that if you run and you slide on your knees and then you rip your shirt off and come to Grandpa. They come running up, and I grab them all, and then I roll on the ground, and it's like, oh, yes. How terrible would it be if they knew not my God? I'm not responsible for my great-grandchildren. Because I will be the old man that they visit and they'll go, why are we visiting this old man? <laughs> Remember how you felt about your great-grandfather? Why are we taking time out of our vacation to go sit in a nursing home and hold some old geezer's hand that's on vent? <laughs> He's got hair coming out his nose. He's got a diaper on. And why are we visiting this guy? 
Oh, but you listen to me. I have made up my mind that I don't care what I have to do. I am going to keep God alive in my children's generation and in my grandchildren's generation. I was getting ready. I was introducing the first speaker on the last night of our teen convention. And, and, uh, and, I, and, and I'm up there. And, and back over to the right was my oldest grandchild sitting with my daughter. The rest were in children's programs. And, and I could see Blake popping his head up. Blake and I have this thing that while I'm preaching, he creates binoculars. <laughs> well, what do you do when you're... You don't care about people, so I'm preaching. Now, the Lord wants everybody to know that God is good and God loves you. <laughs> After I introduced the speaker, he gave me the binocular sign. And so I cut out that back door. I went around and I went, Brother Jenkins, got back there. I shoved the end out of the way and I took, you see, children no longer matter when you have grandchildren. <laughs> When the first child gets married, you're just like, oh, don't leave me. Until grandchildren come along, then you take all your other children, get out of here and give me grandchildren. <laughs> I sat Blake on my lap, and, and, I, and I wear a, a ear mic, and don't judge me too harshly. I don't care what you think, but I wear an ear mic. And uh, so Blake's sitting there, we're watching preaching. He looks up, he said, I want a mic. And I said, you want a mic? He said, yeah, I want a grand bob mic. And I said, what's a grand bob mic? And he goes, Grandbob, I want a Grandbob mic. And I said, why? He said, so I can baptize. <laughs> so I have ordered him on eBay a mic. And every time he comes to church, he's going to wear the mic while Grandbob preaches. You say, oh, that is so cute. You listen to me. I have a responsibility to keep God so exciting in that young man's life and so exciting in those children's life that they don't see Grand Bob at the bar and they don't see Grand Bob out dancing it up and they don't see Grand Bob skipping church to go fishing, but they see Grand Bob every Sunday where he needs to be, coming to church. That's his truck. That's where he preaches at. That's his office. You say, well, I'm not a pastor. No, but you got a pew and you've got a Sunday school class and you should be at church. The generation who knew not the Lord nor his works, it, 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 would it not bother you if, if, if at the great white throne judgment that somebody in line and the Lord said, now your name is Gray is your last name? Uh, I am so sorry. I... I don't see your name. Lord have mercy. Because the end result of you kicking God out of your life is your children die and go to hell. Did you hear that, teenager? They die and go to a devil's hell while you go to heaven. All because you decided, I no longer want God in my life. I'm too tired to go to church. I'm, I don't want that Bible stuff anymore. Oh, the day you got into holy matrimony was the day you pushed pause on anything you wanted, and now you're living for a greater cause. And I'll tell you what we're living for. We are living for that next generation and that next generation, and I've got to give it everything I have for my children and my grandchildren so that they go out of this world knowing my grandfather. Played it straight. Amen. How do you keep a God alive in generations to come? Amen. Four ways. Number one, and I want you to go back to Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9. Boy, I hope you make a decision tonight. You say, well, I've always believed this way. Can I tell you something? Unless you make a conscious decision to believe this way, you won't always believe this way. Right. Make a commitment tonight. Joshua chapter 9, first thing I want to tell you is this. Don't leave the enemy in your generation. You say, how do I keep God alive in the next two generations? Don't leave the enemy alive in your generation. Joshua chapter 9, verse 3. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon, are you there? Heard what Joshua had done unto who? Jericho and to where? He whooped both of them. Now he had to kind of back up and restart Ai, but he, he whooped both of them. The Gibeonites 
heard what was coming down their pike. Yeah. And so look at what they did. Yeah. They did work willily, wildly, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors. Liars. And took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouts upon their feet, and old garments upon them, deceivers. And all the bread of the provisions was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua and to camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country, liar. Now therefore make a league with us. Don't do it, Joshua. Right. And these bottles of wine which were filled were new, liar. And behold, they be rent. And these are garments and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey, liar. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Oh my, look at the first phrase, those six words. And Joshua made peace with them. Brian, come here if you don't mind. Y'all, do you have any idea that grandfather made peace with who God said kill. He made peace. Well, how could he make peace with the enemy? It's found in the verse right before it. Look at it. And ask not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. I know you get tired of us preachers saying to you, read your Bible, spend time with the Lord. And you're like, I don't have time. You listen to me, sir. You're going to fool around day after day after day after day after day and not seek counsel from the Lord. And then you're going to make peace with an enemy that has deceived you into thinking they are your friend. And whether you like it or not, your wisdom to detect and discern what is wrong in your life does not come from the preacher and it does not come from books and it does not come from Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. It only comes when you say, God, I've got to keep you alive in the generations to come. God, please, if there's any enemies in my life, will you let me know where am I being deceived? Where am I being lied to? But they made peace. Can I ask you something? What are you making peace with right now? That you have convinced yourself this is of no consequence. This is of no consequence. You listen to me. Listen to me, you young adults. You're playing a dangerous game by no God in your life. And your excitement for the Lord is dwindling down and you better listen and take heed. Your grandchildren will die and go to hell. Because as an old person, you're either going to be sitting in a recliner grieved because you're getting your grandchild that is tatted up and, 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 and scarred up and drunk out of jail. Or you're going to enjoy the fruits of your grandchildren around you. Singing the praises. You have no right to choose for the generations after you. They may go to the devil, but you listen to me. You let them step over a grandfather's life on their way to the bar. You make them step over a godly grandmother on their way, but don't let them do it out of ignorance. Let them make the decision for themselves, but make them step over your faith to get it done. Would you stop being selfish and would you step out on that line and look down there in your loins right now are children and grandchildren. My life stopped the day I had a child. And what Bob Gray wanted stopped the day I had grandchildren. I don't know what happens with Blake's children. The only generations I'm responsible for are the children we bore and the children they bore. And then after that, I am trusting my children and my grandchildren to keep God alive. Amen. But it all starts with Grand Bob. Amen. Lord, what about it? 
No. No. But guess what you're doing with your music, your entertainment, your associations, your soul drugs that you take to con console you after a bad day? You are making peace. Not all. Can I have 12 guys from the choir? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Would that be okay? Do you all, all mind? Could you line up right here? How do I keep God alive in the generations to come? I'm trying to hurry. Next. I'm going to use you. Come here. You're up. You, you've been a good subject all week, and I've been thinking to myself, come on, get up here. Who can I pick on? It's you. <laughs> Go back to Judges chapter 1, verse 19. I'm going to tell you this. You may not think so, but your influence is greater than what you think Amen. on the next two generations. Amen. Did you hear that? Your influence is greater than what you think. Look at Josh, Judges chapter 1, verse 19. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. This is the oldest. So he couldn't drive them out, so he left an enemy. Look at Judges chapter 1, verse 21. Benjamin left the Jebusites. Verse 27, Manasseh left Beth Shehan. Look at verse 29, Ephraim left the Canaanites. Look at verse 30. Zebulun left Kitron. Look at verse 31. Asher left Akko. Look at verse 32. The, the, the Asherites, Asher also left the Canaanite. Verse 33. Naphtali left Beth Shemesh. Y'all, listen to me. Do you know why you have generations of your last name that carry such a curse? It's not because of a generational demon. Don't we love to blame it on something else? Something else? You know what it is? Because you left pornography, then I want you, rest of you guys, go get somebody and bring them back. Then every, go ahead, then, then everybody in your generation knows, well, great grandpa, he had a little bit of pornography going on, and he, you know, he had a little bit of that country and western music in his pickup truck, and he had a little bit of dip and skull in there, and he, you know, he really didn't play it straight all the time. And whoever you brought up, have them face you. You stand in a straight line like you were and have them face you. Listen to me. And we wonder why that a generation after generation after family members after family members that we have created such a mess that we can't trust our nieces with the uncles and we can't trust our nephews with the aunts and we can't trust them with our cousins and this is all messed up. Right. Right. Want to know why? Because somebody said, well, you know, a little pet enemy that I've made peace with, it's going to be no big deal. Amen. And then people picked up on your influence. Right. Good. And if you could be a good Christian after all with leaving a little bit of your country and Western music in your life, can we just get honest? Well, if you can be a good Christian dipping a little skull every once in a while, drinking a little bit on the side, then you really have any room to stand on to get after the others? Oh, they may get an enemy in their life, Brother Connor, but it won't be because Grand Bob left one in his life. You guys can have a seat. Your influence is much greater than what you think. And don't you think for one second they, have a, they, they don't pick up on what you watch at night. And they don't pick up. Let's do some surgery right now. They're picking up on your enemy. And some of you teenagers are fooling around. And some of you young adults are fooling around with enemies in your life. And let me tell you something. When you get married, those enemies come out in full force. And you have no idea what you're fooling with. You are responsible for the next two generations. Now, get with it. Your influence. Next. Look at Judges chapter 1, verse 19. And, I'm, and I'm, I honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wind it up here. 
Judges chapter 1, verse 19, the Lord was with Judah. How do you keep God going in your generations? One, don't leave the enemies in your generation. Realize your influence is huge. Number three, get rid of the excuses. Judges chapter 1, verse 19, the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants on, of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. What's the next word, please? Because. What have you created that you can't get rid of? Can I tell you something? You're not a victim. Did they not soon forget that, the, that these chariots of iron, God already proved that he could take care of chariots? God already proved he could take care of the big armies and the chariots. He did it once. He'll do it again. But they made it bigger than what it is. Oh, you don't understand. I'm being dragged into that pornography. No, you're not. You're going willingly into that pornography. We have raised a soft generation that you ain't got the manhood to stand up and admit it, sir. I'm a low life, and I just love the stuff, and I've got to have help. Because when are we going to drop the excuses and realize the only reason you're leaving chariots is because you want to ride. You don't want to get all of it because you're covering all your bases. Oh, we, got, we got two generations. And when we start creating excuses why we can't go to church, then your children are going to create excuses why they can't go to church. And then your grandchildren are going to follow up and create excuses. And your third generation is going to die and go to hell. With your last name and your DNA. Stop making excuses. Well, my car's broke down. You got a foot, now walk it. You spend all your money on everything else, get Uber to bring you. You can get your, you can get your, get your homeboys and your mama, different mama friends, and you, and you can get them to take you wherever you want to go. Oh, y'all look at me, but I'm going to tell you right now, I've made up my mind that I'm not letting God get kicked out of my generation because I've got children and grandchildren at stake. Hey. Hey. Last thing's this. Your enemy today will become their religion tomorrow. Yes. I want you to go to Judges chapter 2, and in the midst of this, verse 10 and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served, oh, no, 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 no. Served who? Mm-mm. Uh-oh. Served Balaam in verse 11. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other of the gods of the that were round. Oh, you listen to me. You see, if you kick God out of your generation and you keep making excuses, they will pick up the religion on the Sundays that you don't go to church. They'll pick up the Hollywood religion. They'll pick up the atheist religion. Look at verse number 13. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and who? Oh, y'all, if you know anything about that God right there, that God calls God to divorce his people over. That God is a lewd, wicked, vile, sensual God. And God's been so kind of a, to us and to our children as not to describe that God in his written word. They will die and go to hell. I'm keeping God alive in my generation Amen. so that my kids get saved. But more than that, so my grandkids get saved. But more than that, so they'll keep God alive in their generation. I'm done with this illustration. Do you remember I told you my great-grandfather ran? 
Remember I told you my grandfather was raised with no God in his life, got saved later after the three older, my two older uncles and my older aunt. But unfortunately, my uncle, one of my uncles had children. I was standing, we were standing at my grandmother's funeral and I'm married by this time. I am well established with a wife and children and my grandmother now goes home to be with the Lord. And we're at the funeral. You can tell all these people are grays because we all look alike to some degree. I'm standing next to a gentleman that uh, I thought he had married into the family. And uh, so we're just chit-chatting and I simply said, hey, hey, my name's Bob and, and I belong to Glenn. That's the uh, fourth child down. And uh, he said, hey, Bob. He called his name because we're live stream. I won't go into a lot of the details. And, and he said, hey, I belong to so-and-so. Y'all, it was like, y you do? So, so then you're my cousin. He goes, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I said, uh, I've never met you. One. Two, I have never heard of you. Now, now, 10 years older than I am, I'm 49. That would make him 59. Gray, y'all, gray, gray. We carry the last name. And I said, where do you live? And he says, well, you know, I, I live in such and such a state. And I said, I preach there all the time. I said, when I'm in town the next time preaching, let's go get a cup of coffee. He said, I would love that. I said, man, I would love to catch up on, on, on just family, where you've been all my life. And, and, and I said, better than that, why don't you just be my guest at church? And I'll have, I'll have the driver stop by. We'll pick you up, go to church, enjoy church, and then go out and get something to eat. He said, I don't do church. Okay, how does a great not do church? <laughs> Y'all, we were born in church. Like in the nursery, my mama had me in the nursery. <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you not do church? He goes, well, you, you know, as we both know, grandmother, she was a believer. But I never did. And he said, in fact, I'm what y'all would call an atheist. And I was like, how, how does a gray become an atheist? Because my great-grandfather said, no God. And because my grandfather grew up with no God. And by the time he got right with God and got saved, my older uncles were out of the house on their own. But by the grace of God, I wasn't born in the older set of kids. But along came Robert Glenn Gray, married Leanne Weisseifel, passed down a God. And now I pass it down to my children. And now I'm trying to pass it down to my grandchildren. I only have two shots of keeping God alive. So I would tell you this. If you don't have a godly heritage, start it now. Make up your mind you're going to keep God in your life. If you come from a godly heritage, keep it going. Be done with it. Be done with the world. Keep it going because it's a ride and a half. Amen. I'm enjoying my life right now. Amen. And as Brother Jenkins said this morning, it's just getting gooder and gooder and gooder. You've been very kind. I've enjoyed Faith Harbor this year probably more than I have any other year. I'm walking away a refreshed Christian with a deeper love for the Lord. And I'm going to go back, and I'm going to keep God alive. Every six months I go through and look at my music, my TV that I watch, my associations, and I clean out any Gibeonites because I don't want any enemies in my land. And I start all over with a fresh outlook on God because i got to make sure that I'm not deceived because you know who pays? Grandchildren pay. You have children yet to be born. 
You have grandchildren yet to be born. Can I tell you, Brother Connor, thank you for keeping God alive for your son, for those grandchildren. Brother Bell, Miss Bell, Miss Connor, thank you. Because those grandchildren have a unique privilege of seeing y'all in church. And if they're not saved, they'll get saved at such a young age. And they'll escape all hell. Because you decided, and you decided, I'm not kicking God out of my life. Amen. If you've got parents and grandparents that have been in church, you better give them a call and thank them. Amen. You better thank them. My favorite instrument is that right there. I love the organ. Because for I would sit at my grandmother's feet and I would watch her work those pedals with her stocking feet. Then she would play on two levels and she would sing to the top of her lungs. And I would think to myself, that's my grandmother. Then I would watch my father and my mother with God in their life. Keep it going. May there never be a generation that has your last name that says, God who? Church what? Bible? No, I don't own one of those. May we keep God alive. God bless you. Amen.